So at this point, you should be able to draw molecular compounds in two-dimensional Lewis structures. But as we know, matter doesn't exist in two dimensions, it exists in three dimensions. So how do we take these two-dimensional Lewis structures and represent them in three-dimensional space, especially when we're limited to drawing these things on a two-dimensional plane like a piece of paper or displaying them on a computer screen? Well, like most things in life, it can be answered with balloon animals. This, for example, is a snake that ate a dumbbell. Any rate, this, in fact, these balloons, can help us illustrate what goes on between bonded atoms in a molecule. You see, we can treat this center right here as an atom, and this atom is bonded to two other atoms. And these balloons are something that we refer to as electron domains. Now in this instance, I'm treating these as bonded electrons, but they could be non-bonded electrons as well. And we can see what happens with these balloons if we try to get them to interact. They arrange themselves in space as to minimize the repulsion between them. And electrons, whether they be bonded or non-bonded, do the same. In fact, we have a theory that explains the shape of molecules like this called valent shell electron pair repulsion theory, or VESPER theory for short. And what it tells us is that the electrons in these electron domains around a particular atom will arrange themselves to minimize the repulsive force between these electrons. Remember, electrons have a similar charge. They have a like negative charge. So they're going to arrange themselves to minimize that repulsive force and to maximize the space between them. Now this is one of the simplest molecular classes. We refer to this as an A, A being the central atom, X, two-classed molecule. The X is referring to the two peripheral atoms on the outside. And this is a linear molecule because the uh, shape of this molecule, if we were to draw the lines between the central and peripheral atoms, gives us a line. And it has a bond angle of what we say 180 degrees because from here to here we have a 180 degree angle between the two bonds. If we added a third bonded atom to this structure, you can see that what we would have here is a set of three grapes? Anyway, this structure that we have here is one that still exists in a linear plane, much like our linear AX2 class molecule, but this, if we treat all of these electron domains as bonded pairs of electrons, arrange themselves in such a way to again minimize the repulsive force between them according to Vesper theory, and we can see that they arrange themselves so that there is a 120 degree bond angle. We refer to this class of molecule as an AX3 or trigonal planar because it's a triangle all in the same plane. So this is an AX3 class trigonal planar molecule with one central atom and three peripheral atoms. Now at this point you're probably thinking, well all of these things are still in the same plane. I can, I can still draw all of these Lewis structures on a piece of paper two-dimensionally with lines representing the bonds between the central and peripheral atoms. And I would say to you, yeah you're right, but what would happen if we were to add one more atom to this structure? like this. And here we have a structure that you might predict would look like a cross or a plus. But in reality, the bond angles for this, this AX4 class molecule, doesn't have bond angles of 90 degrees. Rather, it distributes itself in three-dimensional space, and the bond angles that exist within this AX4 class molecule are actually not 90 degrees. Remember, this is 360 degrees, three dimensions. The bond angle that exists here is 109.5. Now this 109.5 bond angle is characteristic of what we call a tetrahedral shape. It has four enclosed sides, a tetrahedron, hence a tetrahedral shape. So regardless of whether we're looking at that linear molecule, the trigonal planar molecule, or the tetrahedral molecule, all of these have Vesper pairs around them, these electron domains that could either be bonded pairs or lone pairs. In this case, they've all been bonded pairs. And Vesper pairs aren't limited to just being single bonds, they could be double bonds or triple bonds, but each one of these bonds, regardless of whether they're single, double, or even triple, are treated as one Vesper pair. So in all of these instances, we've taken a look at molecules in which the Vesper pairs are all bonded pairs. 
and they all, for all of these molecules, obey the octet rule. But there are some molecules that can undergo octet expansion and give rise to other shapes like this AX5 class molecule, which we refer to as a trigonal bipyramidal shape. And we even have an AX6 class molecule, which as you can see has eight sides enclosed and we refer to this as octahedral. Now all of these shapes are what we refer to or what I refer to as parent shapes. That is, all of the Vesper pairs are bonded pairs. So all of the electron domains exist as bonded pairs. But if we take a look at a molecule like ammonia, for example, and we were to draw it out, notice that around that central nitrogen there is a lone pair of electrons. That is, we have four electron domains, we have three bonded pairs and one lone pair. And that lone pair affects the shape. So even though it is an AX3 in terms of the central and peripheral atoms, there is that electron pair around that central atom. So even though it should look like a tetrahedral shape if we consider all four electron domains, that lone electron pair affects our shape. And it does so because that lone set of electrons occupies a little bit more space because it's not tied or bonded between two atoms. So it actually has a greater repulsive force on the bonded pairs than the bonded pairs have on one another. So in Vesper theory, it's important to remember that lone pairs have a greater repulsive force than bonded pairs. So in this molecule, even though it has that four electron domain, we have to remember that only three of those domains are bonded pairs, and one of those domains is a lone pair, and that lone pair affects the shape. So rather than having a tetrahedral molecule with a 109.5 uh, bond angle, we have bond angles that are less than 109.5 because that lone pair forces those uh, bonded pairs together. Now, I'm not going to have you memorize any of the variant bond angles as they call them, and when I refer to a variant, I'm just talking about any of these molecular shapes that give rise from a parent shape due to the presence of a lone pair. But it should be important to note that these variants are going to have bond angles that are going to be less than the parent shapes due to the repulsive force of the lone pairs. So, I know watching this video we could look at it and say, my goodness, look at all of those shapes. But there is a procedure that you should go through to figure out how you can represent each of these in three-dimensional space. And if we take a look at, say, ammonia again, we can figure that out. The first thing that you're going to want to do is draw that two-dimensional Lewis structure and identify how many electron domains you have around that central atom. In this case, for ammonia, as I've mentioned, we have four. One of those is a lone pair of electrons. So we have to take a look first at the parent shape and realize that with those four electron domains, the parent shape of ammonia would be tetrahedral, and we would predict that the bond angles would be 109.5. But since one of these lone pairs exist within this molecule, we have to identify what potential variant structure it's going to have. Now if we take a look at this table, and there are many tables and many textbooks that you can reference, we can see that we have an AX3E class molecule. Again, A, one central atom, the nitrogen, 3, X3, the three hydrogen atoms, and E representing that one lone pair around the central atom, and this tells us that we are going to have a trigonal pyramidal shape. And we can say that because there is that lone pair there that the bond angles are going to be less than 109.5, and then we have the shape for it. Now notice how we have to draw these structures. It is three-dimensional in space. Remember the balloon animal I made with those four balloons? Notice that it didn't appear in one plane, that it was in three-dimensional space. So the way that we orient it, the way that we draw it is like this. And you can see that the straight lines indicate that we have that structure in the plane of the paper, and we have a triangle projecting out, indicating that one of these uh, peripheral atoms is projecting out towards the viewer, and a dashed triangle line indicating that this one is projected back. So that's how we identify and show that we have something that is three-dimensional. And you can see that as we move through the structures, that we have different ways of representing the projection into and away from the viewer. So with an AX5 class molecule, it would be represented like this. 
And with an AX6 class molecule, it would be represented like this. And then of course with the variants thrown in, there's a whole bunch of different structures that we can go through and illustrate how these molecules are represented in three-dimensional space. But the only way you're going to be able to do this is practice. So get out there, use what you've learned in this video, and try taking your two-dimensional drawings from a two-dimensional plane and a piece of paper to a three-dimensional representation on a plain piece of paper. Hopefully you have a better understanding now of how to take those two-dimensional Lewis structures and according to Vesper theory, represent them in three-dimensional space, identify their names, bond angles, and structures. Thanks for watching.